So, okay, let's continue with the second plenary lecture of this morning. Uh, seeing that we are ready and we are on time. So, I'm going to say a few words about Lai San Yan uh, contribution in dynamical systems and in mathematics. Uh, I can say that it's a hard work because she has done so many contributions. In a certain way, if you do a glimpse onto her work, you will realize that it is like a ride on the modern theory of dynamical systems. And in fact, in her earliest contribution, she went on to one of the main topics in dynamics, which is basically to try to show that how a chaotic system provides a good statistical descriptions. And there is this early word that is extremely well known in the dynamical system commu community that she brewed with Le Drapier, that shows how in the case of certain type of dynamics, there is a deep interlink between different notions in dynamical system, which is on one side, Lyapunov's exponent, entropy, and fractal geometry. Probably any student in dynamical system know what they know the result, and they use it. And in certain way, this was a kind of uh, an important tool of understanding non-uniform chaotic systems. But it's true that at this time, the non-uniform chaotic systems, there were few examples. So following the works of Benedict Carlson, Liza and Jan and her contributors, they developed a more conceptual approach that helps to go from some particular system to have a more general framework. And this general framework have a glimpse, have the flavor, or let's say non-uniform geometrical structures that have the particularity that helps to get a better understood of those particular examples, but also to generate new ones. So nowadays, there is a tool that she introduced that everybody refer to those tools by Lies and Young Towers. Um, but she didn't stop there. She showed that in certain way, uh, those examples or those, those type of system appear in a natural way when you consider models they are coming from natural science. But she went a step further, and really a much more difficult task which is kind of going beyond of looking for nails in the case that you have a hammer, but calling the responsibility of a dynamical system, saying, well, I would like to understand problems coming from natural science, but not just with her tools, with their needs. And she worked hard on problems coming from biology. And I think that I would like only to say two things about those uh, recent contributions that he, she had done, then on one side, it shows how powerful are the mathematical approach in the term of ideas that it can be used to understand problem in natural science, but basically showing how in natural science it's possible to work with the rigor of mathematicians. And also, it's interesting that she was also as I say, calling the, calling the responsibility. And so dealing with problems that actually biologists, in the particular case of neuroscience, they are interested. And this can provide, especially for the next generations, a new theoretical challenge. So I hope that the talk give us a perspective of the modern theory of dynamical systems and her contributions. And so please, let's welcome Lai San Yan, and let's enjoy the ride. Thank you, uh, Enrique, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak here. Okay. So my field is dynamical systems, and dynamical systems is about time evolutions of processes. Okay. It's a study of change, of moving objects and evolving situations. Our goal is to understand phenomena, to describe, to analyze, to explain, and ultimately to predict. Okay? Now this talk is gonna be mostly about my own work, 
but to put things into context, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my field. Okay. So dynamical systems is by now a little bit over 100 years old. In many ways, it began with the work of Poincaré, who developed, pioneered the geometric or qualitative theory of ordinary differential equations and applied it to the study of celestial mechanics. It was also inspired by the ergodic hypotheses and other ideas from statistical mechanics, okay, often attributed to Boltzmann from even earlier. Okay. The laying of foundation for the field happened in the early part of the 20th century and the three main areas up to about the 1960s. And the th main areas of activities were ergodic theory, which is the probabilistic, probabilistic approach to dynamical systems, KAM theory, the study of quasi-periodic systems, pioneered by Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser. And while KAM theory is about dynamical systems that are very orderly, at the opposite end of the order-disorder spectrum is hyperbolic theory, the study of chaotic dynamical systems pioneered by Smale, Sinai, Ruel, et cetera. Okay. From the 1970s on, the field matured and, and diversified. And many, many directions, it developed in many, many directions, among which here are a few. Okay. For example, there is the combination of ergodic theory and hyperbolic dynamics to the study of smooth ergodic theory. And low dimensional dynamical systems are naturally more developed than high dimensional ones for the simple reason that they are more amenable to analysis. There is the analysis of concrete models such as the Lorentz attractor in billiards okay, and the study of group actions more general for groups more general than the real line and, and, and the uh, integers and many, many, many more, and I've obviously named more of the things that I know than the things that I don't, okay? And then there is the making of connections, okay? Right from the start, dynamical systems has been um, naturally connected to many disciplines. It was born of such connections, and these connections have developed over the years. They have strengthened, oh, in fact, over the years, okay? Today, it's uh, connected to many branches of mathematics, pure mathematics, probability, analysis, differential geometry, number theory, etc. It's well connected to applied mathematics and to engineering and to the physical and biological sciences. Okay. So, so I entered the field when phases three and four were well underway. And the things that I'm going to tell you about can be seen as developments of these two phases. Okay. So in the rest of the lecture, I like to um, give, present uh, five snapshots of my work. And um, these will be uh, little segments, five little segments that I hope together will give you a flavor of what I do and what people do in dynamical systems. All right. Okay, topic number one, it's about entropy, the Epinoff exponents, and fractal dimension. Okay. I chose this topic to illustrate the power of ergodic theory to summarize succinctly relations and phenomena that could otherwise be very complicated. And ergodic theory does this through the studies of averages and almost sure behaviors, and I hope that my result will illustrate this point. Okay. So let me start with an example that everybody knows and loves, the middle third Cantor set. Okay. The middle third Cantor set can be seen as an invariant set for the map f of x equals 3x mod 1, uh, x belonging to the unit interval. The way you can view this as an invariant set is to look at a set of points whose orbits never enter the middle third of the interval. Okay. Now, it's an easy fact that the Hausdorff uh, dimension of the Cantor set is log two over log three. It's, a, it's an exercise for a freshman class. Okay. And uh, I guess at this point, I should say something about the color code that I use in my talk. Okay? I like to give interpretations to mathematical results whenever I can. And I write them in green so that you can to distinguish them from formal mathematical statements. Okay? So now I'd like to offer my explanation, my interpretation of the numbers two and three in this formula. Okay? Two is the degree of complexity. It's like a branching number because starting from a point in the interval, uh, you are not allowed to go to the middle, so you get to choose to go either to the left or to the right. So there are two choices. So the degree of complexity is two, okay? 
3, well, that, of course, is the derivative of the map f of x equals 3x mod 1. Right? So in this formula, it says that the Hausdorff dimension of the uh, Cantor set is equal to its degree of complexity, log of the degree of complexity, divided by the rate of expansion. Okay? And I'd like to show that this idea is much, much more general than the Cantor set. So the setting that I would like to go to now is that of a compact Riemannian manifold without boundary, M, and a mapping of the manifold to itself, a different morphism that is a little bit more regular than C1. And mu is going to be an F invariant Borel probability measure on M. Okay. In most of my talk, I'm going to assume that this invariant measure is ergodic. It's really not necessary, but it simplifies things a little bit. If you want to lose the word ergodic, then you replace some of the things that I say are numbers by functions. Okay, so I'm going to, in this setting, I'm going to introduce three invariants, namely the three items in the title of, of this part. And uh, the, I'm going to begin with the, the definition of dimension. Okay. The dimension of the measure mu is delta if at mu almost every point, if you take a small, small ball of radius rho, then the measure of the ball is rho to the delta. So for example, uh, for the bank measure on the plane, if you take a small ball, it scales like rho squared. Its area scales like rho squared. So its dimension of uh, two-dimensional bank measure is two. Okay? So, and so on. So the second invariant that I like to introduce is entropy. Okay. Entropy is a measure of predictability of dynamical events. Okay. And for measure preserving transformations, in other words, mappings of measure spaces that preserve an invariant measure. And I'd like to give you a quick uh, um, uh, definition of entropy. Well, to uh, define it, we first coarse grain or take a finite partition of the, of the phase space. Then the entropy of the partition is defined to be the formula stated up there, which is the mean of the information function. Now, a little bit of interpretation. For dynamical systems, the way to, one way to think about this is like this. Suppose I choose a point at random according to the measure mu. I'm not going to tell you which point I pick, and I ask you to guess. Okay. I, I ask you to guess which partition element contains that point. The degree of uncertainty that you have in making this guess is the entropy of the partition. So for example, if I have a partition with 10 elements, and one of them is huge and the other nine are tiny, then it's pretty easy for you to guess. Entropy is low. If all 10 are roughly the same size, you have a much harder time to guess. Entropy is higher. That's what entropy of a partition means, and it's a static notion, no dynamics yet. Now enters the dynamics. The dynamics of a, a, a transformation is a measure of its dynamical complexity, and it means exactly the same thing. I pick a point at random, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, but you get to watch it for as long as you want, and I will tell you which partition element it visits, and then you guess where it's going to go next. And that, is the that, that limit is, is the definition of entropy for a, for, for, uh, a transformation. Okay? It is a prediction of um, where, the or where orbits are going to go. Okay? Okay. For the third invariant is Lyapunov exponents. Okay? Lyapunov exponents is a measure of the rates at which nearby orbits diverge. Okay? So people often formulate this in infinitesimal terms. So you take a point x and you take a tangent vector v, and lambda of xv is the rate of growth of the derivative applied to this tangent vector as you iterate the map. Okay? So this is another way of saying if you take two points that are roughly in the direction of v, how quickly they diverge. Okay? So then one might wonder whether these numbers exist, and they do. There is a multiplicative ergodic theorem proved in the 1960s that says that whenever you have a measure-preserving transformation, and again, I'm giving the uh, uh, slightly simplified version for the ergodic case, then there is a finite set of numbers, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, so that for almost every point, if you take any tangent vector and compute its growth rate, it always exists, and the limit always exists, and it's equal to one of these numbers, lambda i. Okay. Now, it actually says a little bit more than that, 
Okay. For each lambda i, there's a subspace consisting of all vectors that grow with, at that rate. So it's the decomposition of the tangent space at each point into a direct sum of subspaces that are invariant along orbits. It's very much like an eigenvalue decomposition of uh, linear maps for a single linear map, except that these orbits are moving along and you have this uh, moving frame of invariant subspaces uh, at, uh, corresponding to the different Lyapun rates of growth of the Lyapunov exponents. Okay, so now all the pieces are in place and I would like to um, present my result, okay? Uh, so the first result is joined with uh, from Le Drapier and the, the, uh, the setting is as I have told you. It consists of a compact manifold, a diffeomorphism, and an ergodic invariant measure. I'm gonna call the Lyap positive Lyapunov exponents lambda one, lambda two, and so on. And lambda i has multiplicity mi, meaning that the dimension of the subspace of vectors growing at that rate has dimension mi, okay? Now, these are not the only Lyapunov exponents. If it has positive exponents, it's gonna have negative ones. But for this result, I care only about the positive ones, so I only um, introduce these, okay? And the conclusion of this theorem says that, okay, for in each, for corresponding to each one of the Lyapunov exponents, lambda i, there is a number delta i, which one should, one can think of, and it in fact really is, the dimension of the measure in that direction, roughly speaking, that is, that's why I've put it in quotation, okay? And these numbers delta i have the property that entropy is equal to the summation of lambda i times delta i, okay? Now, delta i is the dimension of the measure in the direction, uh, in, 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 in the direction of the subspace corresponding to lambda i, so it cannot be bigger than mi. So delta i is a number between zero and mi, okay? So another way to see this result is that if you write the positive Lyapunov exponents as a vector, lambda one, lambda two, and so on, and if you write the partial dimensions as another vector, delta one, delta two, and so on, you take the dot product of these two vectors and you get entropy. Okay. So this is the first, uh, uh, so let me finish the result. And to confirm the fact that these really are uh, dimensions, if you add these things up, you get the dimension of the measure in the unstable direction. Okay. Now, um, let me go back to the Cantor set to see how this works there. Okay. In the Cantor set, we decided that the degree of complexity is two. Right? So the left side of the entropy e equality is log two. And there is only one direction and one Lyapunov exponent, so there's only one term in that sum. And the derivative lambda is log three. We, we, I think we all agree with that. And that's equal to the Hausdorff dimension log two divided by log three. Okay. So this is, a, one could think of this as a, a special case of uh, what goes on in general, okay? I want to stress that this is a very general result. It does not depend on the manifold. It works for all different morphisms and all invariant measures, okay? So it goes quite a bit beyond the Cantor set, okay? So let me summarize by giving you what I think of as the main message of this result. I think of total expansion as given by the summation of lambda i m i. So you take all the positive Lyapunov exponents multiplied by the, uh, its multiplicity, their multiplicities, and you get the total expansion in the system, okay? Entropy is dynamical complexity as we have discussed. So what this result says is that entropy is often smaller than the sum, the total expansion in the system there's less complexity than the total expansion in the system, and the discrepancy it can, be, can be seen as a form of dissipation, and that is reflected in the fractal dimension of the invariant measure, okay? So the way I see it, there's expansion on the one hand, which creates a lot of instability, there's dynamical complexity, the discrepancy between the two is a measure of dissipation, and that is represented by the fractal dimension of the invariant measure. Okay, so that is result number one. So now let me go to, <clears throat> let me go to topic number two, which has to do with correlation decay or statistical properties and geometry. Let me start with geometry by, for dynamical systems, okay. 
For local geometry, I tend to think of a dynamical system as either hyperbolic, meaning the 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 the, the mapping is I, I'm I'm doing this in the, in for mappings, meaning the mapping is saddle-like, okay, like two zero zero half, okay, or elliptical, meaning rotational, or parabolic, with a matrix as written. Okay. Not a formal classification by any means, but it's not a bad way to think about local geometry in dynamical systems. Okay. As for global geometry, I think of this as how the ease with which one moves from one part of the phase space to another. How long does it take to go from here to there okay, globally? Okay. So that's what I mean by geometry in a system. And then I'm going to talk about statistics next of dynamically generated observations. So the setting is as before. There's a mapping of a manifold and invariant measure mu. And now there are phi and psi are observations. Okay. They are nothing more than um, real value functions on the phase space. Think of the dynamical system as very complicated, possibly. And you don't want to keep track of everything. So you take its temperature once a day. So phi is the temperature at day, on day zero. F composed with phi is the temperature of day one. F squared is temperature of day two, and so on. Okay. This sequence of observations can be seen as a stochastic process with underlying probability mu. Okay. Uh, the, the randomness entering only in the initial condition as this is a completely deterministic dynamical system. Okay. The fact that it's an invariant measure says exactly that this is a stationary process. Okay. Now, there is the Gothic theorem, which says that the time averages of these observations will tend to the space average almost surely if, this, if the system is ergodic. Okay. But one can also go beyond this to look at fluctuations around the mean. The ergodic theorem tells you what the mean is, but one could look at fluctuations around the mean or decay of time correlations, and such as the covariance of what you see on day n, how does that co-vary with what you see on day zero? Okay. It's a measure of how the dynamical, the extent to which the dynamical system remembers its past, or how quickly it forgets its past. Okay. It's the rate of memory loss in a dynamical system. It's been known in the 90s, since the 1960s that for dynamical systems of purely hyperbolic type, so dynamical systems where everywhere you have satellite behavior, time correlations always decay exponentially. These and many other results are due to Ruel, et cetera, for this particular class of dynamical systems. Okay. So I wanted to generalize these results to a bigger class of uh, dynamical systems, perhaps not to all, but uh, to at least get out of this purely hyperbolic uh, type. And I was only partially successful, uh, but I'd like to tell you about two of the ideas that I had to extend these ideas to chaotic dynamical systems that are still in the chaotic category, but they're not purely hyperbolic. In other words, there are some other kinds of local geometry around. Okay. So the first of these ideas says the following. Okay. I want to try to, dynamical systems are very messy objects. I want to try to approximate them with objects that are nicer, such as Markov chains. And for dynamical systems that admit something, that I'm going to call accountable Markov extension that I will tell you about in, uh, momentarily, if I could somehow attach a countable Markov chain to a dynamical system, then the statistical properties of the dynamical system can be gleaned from the, the, the Markov chain that, that you use to approximate it. And for a countable state Markov chain, the, the renewal times or the times that it takes for orbits to come back to a particular set that's what determines the statistical properties. So that's what I'm going to do for dynamical systems. So here is the picture. Okay, so given a map F, I'm going to fix a reference set, which is nice, meaning that it has some nice structures, which unfortunately I will not be able to say precisely because it's a little bit technical. But I'm going to choose a nice set. Think of it as a reference set. Think of orbits as starting from there and watch them, trace them until they come back to this reference set in a nice way. OK? 
Okay, so I'm not going to uh, uh, get into detailed. Uh, this is not the right place to to give detailed definitions, but uh, I just want to say that this can be done. It can be made uh, precise and formal. And when you do that, you get a schematic representation of the dynamical system, or rather an extension of the dynamical system uh, in the form of a tower as I've drawn. Okay? The bottom level is the reference set. Look at the thick black line. It moves up. Okay? Each time you iterate the map, it goes up one slot until there's nothing above it. And then it goes back down to the bottom, and it stretches all the way across. Okay? Now, I want to be clear that this is not a Markov chain. Dynamical systems have a lot of nonlinearities. It's not a Markov, it's, it's simply not a Markov chain. It just has some of the properties of a Markov chain, okay? And enough of it that we can lean on the theory of Markov chains to tell us more about dynamical systems. Okay. So now, no, I am not claiming also that you can do this to any dynamical system, but assuming you can do this, for, and I'm going to uh, give you examples in a moment where these constructions, uh, where these constructions can be done, but suppose for the moment that F admits a Markov extension with return time R. Return time is uh, what is crucial, is the time that it takes to the point to come back to, to, to the re reference set. So if uh, for dynamical systems that admit such uh, Markov extensions, if the return time has finite expectation with respect to the bank measure in the unstable direction, then F is an SRB measure, something I haven't de defined, but I'm going to talk about next. It's a very special invariant measure that you want to have. Okay? It's a natural invariant measure that you want to have. Okay? So if the return time has finite expectation, then such a measure exists. And if the return time has a tail that dies out exponentially, so the set of points that, ha that, that haven't returned at time n, if that decreases exponentially with n, then this dynamical system with respect to the natural invariant measure has some exponential decay of correlations. And if the tail has poly decays polynomially, then the cor correlation decay is polynomial and one degree higher. And if the tail decays a little bit faster than one over n squared, that's enough for the central limit theorem to hold. Okay. So these results are true for counter countable state Markov chains, but as I emphasize, my dynamical system is not a Markov chain. I just want to make it look like a Markov chain so that I can borrow ideas from probability. Okay, so this was the first of the two ideas. Next, I want to tell you when these, uh, when these towers can be constructed and how to um, guess at what the tail is gonna look like. So I proposed that these, this construction will provide a, u a, a unified view for a class of dynamical systems with identifiable sources of non-hyperbolicity. So here's what I mean. Think of a dynamical system as predominantly hyperbolic. So most of the phase spaces, you see the saddle-like saddle behavior. But there are some places where it's not like that. But then one should focus on those places, look at how bad they are, and how, for, for, for systems that are uniformly hyperbolic, uh, we already know that the correlation decay ex, uh, exponentially, so if we focus on these places where it's not hyperbolic, it may tell us how much it slows down the, the rate of correlation decay. So here's a, a first example, S a sticky surface. So suppose you have a mapping where the black line is, uh, consists of fixed points, so points that don't move. Other points drift to the right. A point that's at y, height y, will drift at uh, rate, uh, at speed y, okay? Now, so for such a, for, for whenever you see something like this around, at, this, uh, at the sticky surface is obviously the place where the non-hyperbolicity occurs. If you choose a reference set, it's not hard to see that this, uh, if you take a box around this black line, it's not hard to see that the set of points that are stuck there after n iterates is one over n. And then from that, one could see that the rate of uh, the, the tail of any, uh, ret any return time to any uh, reasonable uh, reference set will be polynomial, cannot be faster than this, and so correlation decay cannot be faster than polynomial. Another example, is that of billiards. 
or the two-dimensional two periodic Lorentz gas in particular. Billiards were invented in the, uh, um, many, many years ago as a study of uh, as a, as the uniform motion of a point particle in, in the plane or in higher dimensional space. Okay? And it, it, the point just moves in a straight line until it hits some, um, some obstacle, at which time it reflects back. And the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And that's the class of billion maps. And the 2D two, two periodic Lorentz gases can be described as follows. You place a set of a periodic set of configurators on the plane. Okay? I'm here, I'm representing it on a torus. Okay? And the shaded regions are the scatterers. And the billy particle, this point particle, just moves in between, bouncing off of them uh, as it hits any one of them. So the, the, the physical space for the billiard flow is a torus minus these scatterers, and the phase space of the billiard flow is the, the, the physical space uh, together with the direction of motion. Okay. Now sometimes people study section maps which are simpler. Section maps means that you don't look at the time between collisions. You only catch the particle when it hits, a, uh, uh, when it, when it hits an obstacle. Okay. And so doing that, looking at that, and using uh, Hilda continuous observables, I proved for, for large classes of these maps, namely those where the times between collisions are uniformly bounded. That's the only condition. Okay. I proved that uh, these maps have exponential decay of correlations. Now, uh, how does this fit into the setting of hyperbolic map? Because the scatterers are, because the, the obstacles are convex, when you have a parallel beam of light shining on it, it will disperse. And this is what causes the hyperbolicity. Okay? Well, what are the, the, uh, what are the sources of non-hyperbolicity? They're the glancing orbits. They're the orbits that barely, that hit tangentially or maybe close to tangentially. So that on the, there, it's actually a discontinuity for the section map because if you hit a little bit to one direction, you will bounce off the scatterer. And if you go a little bit in the other direction, you will miss it altogether and go to the next scatterer. Okay. Now, these results, of course, didn't come out of nowhere. There were earlier results in 1970, 1980, and, and, and uh, ergodicity was proved in about 1970. Uh, some other results on statistical properties were proved by Sinai, Bunimovich, and Chernoff in 1980 and 90. And there are very recent results by Baladi, Demers, and Liverani on billiard flows that are more difficult than the one that I've showed you because the flow direction contains another difficulty, a very serious difficulty uh, compared to section maps. So this is the end of uh, topic two, and, uh, and I'll go to topic three. Okay? Topic three is about observable chaos. Okay, so here I want to discuss two things. One is what I mean by the term, okay, and why it's challenging to prove. And the second thing is I want to give uh, an example, a class of examples of uh, strange attractors uh, used caused by shear. Okay. So first, what is observable chaos? Okay. Well, in this talk, chaotic behavior has been um, characterized by instability, the rapid separation of nearby orbits, expansion, positive Lyapunov exponents, and so on. I've been using all of those terms somewhat interchangeably. But the fact that chaotic behavior exists doesn't mean you can observe it. Okay? You may not be able to see it. And for finite dimensional dynamical systems, one has often adopted the following point of view. One assumes one equates observable events with positive measure sets. So if a behavior occurs on a set that has zero Lebesgue measure, it's not observable. And observable dynamical behavior are those that are sustained with. In, t in time. So if it's chaotic for a few iterates and then it uh, stops mm, being chaotic, then one, again, I would say in, uh, in, this top, in, in, in the next uh, 10 minutes that this cannot be observed. So for example, if you have a saddle point, of course it has some expanding direction, but it's only one point and I can't see that. Well, what if I look at a whole uh, neighborhood of that, then I can see expansion for qu quite a bit, but then it moves away from the saddle point and possibly head for a stable equilibrium, so it's not sustained in time, and again, I don't see it, okay? So the picture for observable chaos is that of a strange attractor. So uh, this, this, this is just an uh, impressionistic picture of it, that you have an open set that gets mapped into itself, so all the orbits would tend to some set, 
this set is probably not a periodic, not a sink or, or, or a periodic orbit, but a more complicated set because for it to be to have observable chaos, I have to have that Lebesgue almost every point in the basin in the open set, uh, either Lebesgue on almost every point or at least a positive Lebesgue measure set of points will have to have the property that it has positively Epinov exponents. Okay, so po having positively Epinov exponents means that the derivative will continue to grow as you iterate the map. Okay, so there is uh, strange attractors written in green because there is no definition of strange attractor in dynamical systems and no two people would define it the same way and this is how I'm going to think of it in this talk. Okay, so now uh, does such a picture ever exist? For, for dynamical systems that are uniformly hyperbolic, okay, that uh, the uh, Sinai, Ruel, and Bowen uh, constructed a special invariant measure called an SRB measure. This measure has the property that it has densities on unstable manifolds, but more importantly, it has the property that for almost every point in the basin of the attractor, Lebesgue almost every point in the basin of the attractor, time averages converge to a certain space average. Okay? And now, if, if I had written mu almost everywhere instead of Lebesgue almost everywhere, that would be an ergodic theorem. This is not the ergodic theorem. The invariant measure is mu. It's not Lebesgue because it lives on the attractor, and yet uh, a measure that lives on a single uh, measure zero set influences the behavior in a very large open set. Okay? The existence of SRB measure uh, implies observable chaos. It, in fact, implies more than observable chaos. It implies that uh, there's some kind of dynamical coherence on positive Lebesgue measure sets because it tells you that almost all points in the basin have a similar set of asymptotic behavior as time goes to infinity. Okay. So it's a very desirable object to have, and it's a very, uh, very useful tool for proving the existence of observable chaos. Unfortunately, without the uniform separation of expanding and contracting directions, proving the existence of SRB measures has proved to be a very big challenge. Proving either the existence of an SRB measure or the positivity of the Epinoff exponents is a major, major challenge, even for systems that look like it has a great deal of instability. And I want to explain why, okay? Now, if it's a different morphism and it has expansion, that means that it also has contraction somewhere. And if these two, if the expanding and contracting directions are not separated a priori, that means that if you take a point, take a vector, and you iterate it, it sometimes expands, sometimes contracts. Okay. So uh, on balance, is it expanding or contracting? Okay. Uh, there's a lot of cancellation going on, and this cancellation can be a very delicate problem. So as a result of this, there are not many examples of SRB measures outside of the uniform hyperbolic category. Okay. There are some, but not many. And I want to present next one of these examples, or actually is a class of such examples. Now the examples that I'm going to present to you can be part of an ODE, can appear in an ODE, can appear in a PDE, is pretty much dimension independent. Uh, so I'm gonna say it in, uh, for the PDE, which includes the ODE case, of course. So let me first remind you of what a, a generic supercritical Hopf bifurcation is, although I'm sure everybody knows it. Okay. So consider a one parameter family of flows parameterized by mu, okay. and these flows have a fixed point at zero for all mu. Okay. So zero is always a, a stationary point. Okay. And as mu goes from negative to positive, a pair of complex eigenvalues cross the imaginary axis. Okay. And what you, so, so that this fixed point goes from stable to unstable. And as it turns unstable, generically, a little limit cycle appears, the, drawn in red in the picture, and this, uh, uh, the, 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 this limit cycle has radius order of a square root of mu. Okay? And this is the picture of a hop, uh, hop bifurcation. Now, I need to introduce just one number uh, in order to talk about this, and this number is uh, what I call a twist number. So let me first write the bifurcation in normal form. Uh, so uh, where there are only first and third and fifth only odd order terms. The first order term we've already discussed, you have this pair of uh, eigenvalues crossing the imaginary axis. And now I want to look at the third order term, the coefficient of the third order term at zero. And I, the number uh, tau is defined to be the imaginary 
uh, part of this uh, third order term uh, divided by the real part. Okay. Now, in a generic, generically, neither the imaginary part nor the real part is uh, uh, zero, so this number is uh, typically well defined. Okay, this is all that I need to state the theorem. And this theorem was proved uh, with my co-authors Lu and Wang. Uh, and uh, it says the following. Look at an evolutionary uh, PDE, okay, partial TU, plus linear term, plus nonlinear term. The third term on the right side is the forcing. Okay? And assume that this equation generates a C3 semi-flow on a, on a Hilbert space. Okay? Uh, it probably works on a, a Banach space also, but the paper was written for a Hilbert space. Okay? Now, the only assumption that this equation can be anything, but the only an assumption is that for the enforced equation should uh, have a it, it should have a uh, this is a one parameter family of equations, and the enforced system undergoes a uh, uh, generic supercritical hopification. Okay, as for the forcing term, okay, which is the last term, the kappa of u times p, okay. The assumptions are that kappa can be anything, except that it has to move zero. And it has to move it in the direct, it, it can move it in any direction, but the movement has to have a component in the direction where the uh, two, uh, corresponding to the, to, to the two eigenvalues that cross the imaginary axis of the, of the, the two eigenvalues that, that, that give rise to the Hopf bifurcation. Okay, that is the only thing that is required, required of, the, of, of the function kappa of u. P of T says that the, this uh, forcing is essentially um, impulsive in nature. It doesn't have to be an impulse. It can last for a little while, but then there has to be a long relaxation in between the next time it's applied. And this is all that I require of, of the setup. Then the conclusion is that if the number tau times the projection of the k kappa of zero times mu and half, and I'm going to tell you exactly what this is in the next, what this means in the next slide. If this quantity is large enough, then for a measure, positive measure set of times t, t being the uh, interval between the forcing, okay, uh, the flow map phi mu of t has, for, for all small mu, have an attractor with an SRB measure. Okay. So as a consequence of that, there's an open set in the Hilbert space X with positive Lyapunov exponents almost everywhere. And of course, I owe you an explanation for what all, almost everywhere means in a Hilbert space. Okay. So this is the result. Uh, 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 an evolutionary PDE undergoing a generic supercritical half bifurcation, given an impulsive force, and under some reasonable conditions on the twist, okay, one has for large enough times between the, the kicks, one sees a strange attractor with positively Epinoff exponents almost everywhere. Okay. So now this is obviously not a proof, but pictorially, the, uh, one can think of the picture as looking like this. Okay. For the unforced system, there is a, there is a two-dimensional center manifold because it undergoes a Hopf bifurcation, a Hopf and Dronov bifurcation. Okay. If you force it and have a long enough uh, relaxation time, then one again gets, this, uh, uh, gets the center manifold back. Not the same center manifold, it's perturbed, but one again has a center manifold together with a co-dimension two strong stable foliation. So everything squashes quickly to this two-dimensional object which contains the attractor. And when you force it, you don't force along this two-dimensional uh, center manifold. The whole thing gets destroyed, but as you relax, it will come right back to this picture. And now I can tell you what positive Lyapunov exponents almost everywhere means. It, it holds, it, one, of, one sees positive Lyapunov exponents for the big almost every point on any two-dimensional surface transversal to this, uh, to, to the strong stable foliation. This is, this is a co-dimension two strong stable foliation, and any surface that cuts across it trans transversally, almost every initial condition, you will see positively Epinov exponents. So I like to propose this as a notion of obser observability in infinite dimensional space. So there's a notion of typical solutions. If you start with typical uh, finite parameter families of initial conditions, you see the phenomenon almost everywhere. 
Okay, so now the picture. Uh, what is the geometric meaning of this quantity that I said had to be uh, reasonably large, not, not, so, not huge, but reasonably large? Uh, tau is the twist or shear, and um, I, I, it will show up in the picture very quickly. Um, uh, the, the, the middle term is the kick amplitude, meaning how much zero has been transformed. And the third ter uh, term, the mu, uh, one over the square root of uh, mu, is just a normalization to make the, unit, the, the limit cycle unit size, because there's a tiny limit cycle that's appearing after the half bifurcation. So the picture goes roughly like this. At time zero, the gray circle is the original limit cycle. So I'm, I'm drawing this in two dimension, or you can see this as a, a view from above as what's happening projecting in the, in the center direction. So you have, a, you, you have a limit cycle in gray. The kick now just simply moves it to the right. Okay? Now what the twist does is that it says that the, it's, it's all, everything is rotating around because it's a half bifurcation, and the twist says that the speed of rotation depends on distance to the center. Okay. So here in the picture that I have shown, uh, farther away from the center, it rotates faster, and closer to the center, it rotates less fast, cause leading to a tail in, in front. Okay. And then uh, during the relaxation, it comes back. It's, the whole thing kind of comes back to the, uh, closer to the limit cycle, not completely, but it's, it's folded and it comes back. And then you kick it again, and this is repeated. And again, the part that goes out rotates faster, and so on. And the end result is a, a strange attractor with observable chaos. Now, as you can see, you, it doesn't really have to be the kick that I've shown. All you need to do is to distort the original limit cycle so that some points get farther from the center and some points get closer. Then the twist will cause different tails to occur, often multiple tails. It uh, should be reminiscent of uh, the kind of satellite maps that you see on TV when there's a weather system developing. Okay? So uh, this is the result, and it's an example of what I call shear induced chaos, meaning chaotic behavior produced by external forcing, which magnifies the underlying shear in an otherwise non-chaotic system. So you start with a system that is quite non-chaotic, hop bifurcation, a sink turning into a source, nothing much going on, you, but it has some underlying shear. And you start to drive the system, then um, per periodically, with long enough periods in between, then you, uh, a, a, a chaotic attractor can, can develop. Okay? And as, uh, well, these are not the only strange attractors that exist outside of the uh, uniform hyperbolic category, but a very large fraction of the strange attractors that are known that have been proved rigorously to exist outside of the uniform hyperbolic category have something to do with shear. Okay? So this is a kind of a typical example. End of topic three. And the last two topics, I'd like to go to applications of some dynamical systems ideas. So it's going to be a shift in gear now to very different uh, topics. Okay. So the first topic has to do with dy dynamics of infectious diseases. And this is an international team consisting of uh, Stefan Russo from Berlin, uh, Sergei Janchuk, also at Berlin, and Tiago Pereira of Sao Paulo. Okay. So. Oh, there are many, many models of classical models of the spreading of infectious diseases, such as SIS, SIR, they're quite well known. By infectious diseases, I mean diseases that are spread, the transmission of, 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 of which uh, is due to uh, direct contact between uh, infected individuals. Okay? Uh, this is to be distinguished from diseases that are transmitted uh, via uh, another vector. Okay? So in, in many of these models, in most of these models, you, one thinks of a big network with lots of nodes, as, the, as I have shown. And the nodes are divided into healthy and susceptible and infected. And the, you, one can infect one's neighbors and at a certain rate, and infected nodes recover in a certain rate, and so on. Okay? So what I'd like to uh, talk about in the next uh, five, 10 minutes is a general study of the effectiveness of response at an outbreak. So it's not a study of how a disease spreads, but rather how effective a response can be or has to be to curb an outbreak. Okay? And it's a general study in the sense that it is not directed at any one disease in particular. In instead, I'm trying to uh, glean some information over that's, uh, that's common to many diseases. 
So the suppose consider a situation when um, an outbreak of some infectious disease occurs uh, unexpectedly. Okay? So there's, maybe there's no vaccine or not enough of a stockpile of vaccine or one doesn't even know what the means of trans transmission is so one doesn't know how to stop it. Okay. So the, 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 uh, uh, a strategy that's been used through the ages and continues to be used is the isolation of infected hosts. So in, you, one isolates the individuals who are infected in the hope of um, uh, disconnecting the, the infection pathway. Okay. Now, but if the disease, if the outbreak occurs in an un unexpected way, then uh, one is generally unprepared. Okay. It's difficult to, you have to, uh, to, to isolate the infected host. You have to be able to find them as soon as they get sick so they don't infect the, their neighbors. Uh, there has to be facilities to house the uh, people in isolation and so on. So it's, it's uh, ideally, you know, one, one, one is uh, prepared at all times for all eventualities, but that is really impossible. So even though there is an isolation strategy, its implementation is usually imperfect. Okay. So the, this this uh, the study is about how the study is about how 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 much of a response is needed and how quickly one has to act in order to curb an outbreak. Okay. So the model is uh, uh, here's a simple uh, picture diagram of the model. The top part is uh, what is the usually the uh, SIS or SIR um, uh, model. There is the group of healthy and susceptible individuals. There is the infected. The healthy and uh, the, the the infected in, in uh, uh, they they infect their neighbors at rate beta and the infected then um, recover at rate gamma. Okay. Now what is new here is the bottom part. Okay. The response. So suppose that with probability p, you are able to identify an individual who is infected with probability p. You can't do this immediately, and on average it takes you tau days to identify this individual. Before this individual is identified and goes into isolation, he continues to infect. But once he goes into isolation, he doesn't infect anyone anymore. And then a couple of days later, he leaves isolation and is healthy again. This is a very simple model. And we've called it the SIQ model, Q for quarantine. Okay, so I've just repeated the same picture. Now, there are, of course, uh, one needs to add other things to make the model more realistic, such as incubation period, or more accurately called uh, the latency of the disease, acquired immunity, and so on. And we have added those in the model, but since I'm talking about, since I'm focusing on the response, let me just focus on this part of the picture. So, uh, S of T, I of T, Q of T, are the fractions of populations that are healthy, infected, and in quarantine. Okay. And if I go to a continuum limit and do the usual thing of assuming that there's no correlation between the healthy uh, part of the population and the infected, then one derives the following uh, delay differential equations, uh, uh, system of delayed differential equations. You don't have to read these equations. They only say, they don't say anything more than what I have written up there in the diagram, the transfer of mass from one category to the other. Okay. But let me go over the key quickly. So the key ingre the ingredients are beta is transmission rate, gamma is recovery rate, M is the number of average number of neighbors that you can infect, P, so these three, beta, gamma, and M, are things that belong in standard uh, theory, existing theory. The new ones are P, the probability of locating, being able to isolate and infect an individual after he gets sick, and tau is the delay in time that it takes to find that individual, and kappa is the isolation period. Okay, so these are the players in this uh, system of delayed differential equations. And these de delayed differential equations can be shown to, to, to produce a C1 semi-flow on a Banach space of functions uh, to R3. R3 are, of course, the three quantities, S, I, and Q and uh, tau and kappa are the times that it, the delays that happen. Uh, and so with the, once we have a C1 semi-flow, we have an infinite dimensional dynamical system, which I can then apply dynamical systems techniques to. 
Now, before I state the result, I want to first, uh, I need to first uh, give you uh, uh, a number, which is the disease reproduce, repro re reproductive number. It's a very standard quantity that's been used in, in, in the subject for a long time. R is the, uh, is the rate of transmission divided by the rate of recovery. So it basically is like a branching number that tells you how quickly the disease reproduces itself. Okay? And given this, um, so here's the result. Suppose I start with an initial condition near S IQ equals 100. In other words, no one is sick, everyone is healthy, and I didn't write it down, but everyone is vulnerable, so no one is immune. Okay? And suppose a small outbreak occurs. Whether or not this outbreak is contained depends on a quantity that I call epsilon, which one should think of as the response capability. Now, I should have told you earlier that for R, the reprodu disease reproductive number, if R is bigger than one, then the disease, if you do, suppose you do nothing, absolutely nothing. If R is bigger than one, then the disease spreads, and if R is smaller than one, then the, then the outbreak is contained by itself without you doing anything. So obviously, if I need to talk about the response, I'm assuming that R is bigger than one. So if R is bigger than one, then the infection is contained if the response is bigger than one minus one over R. So that is the crucial number. And what is epsilon? Epsilon is P e to the minus gamma tau, where P is the isolation probability, tau is the delay, and uh, gamma is the recovery rate. Okay. So here's a quantity that's very important that tells you whether this response is enough to stop the disease or whether it will spread. So in particular, to contain an outbreak, you must be able to isolate at least one minus one over R fraction of the uh, people who, who got infected. But that's only a theoretical number. If you, are, if you find these people, you have to put them into isolation immediately. Uh, no delay, one cannot afford any delay. But if P is bigger than this critical value of PC, then there's a delay that one can afford, and the critical delay is uh, given by the formula. And uh, basically, if you, meet, if you do it faster than this, then the disease is contained. If you don't, then it spreads. Now, that is in the situation where uh, no one is immune in the, in the population, but if a certain fraction of the uh, population is immune, either from prior exposure from a previous outbreak or from vaccination or whatever, then the response required is bigger than one minus one over R minus one, one minus R, okay. It's, uh, it's uh, the response needed is less, the larger the fraction of pe Im people who are immune to the disease naturally. Okay. Now, I want to stress that these numbers uh, can be computed very easily, that once you know the disease reproductive number and the recovery rate, then these numbers can be computed. So here's, uh, here are some examples of real diseases for which we have computed it for. So look at, for example, e uh, Ebola in Sierra Leone in the third row. The disease reproductive number is 2.5. Recovery rate, on average, it takes about 12 days to recover. And the critical isolation probability is 0.6. And if you do 0.8, which is what is assumed in this paper, then you have three days to isolate the individuals to, for, to contain the disease. Smallpox is the most dangerous one. It's R is really big, okay, the last line, R is really big. The person is infected for a very long time. The, the, the critical uh, probability of isolation is 0.79, and if you only do 0.8, that's way close to the limit, and you have a quarter of a day of four hours to identify the individuals, if you can only identify 0.8 of them, and so on. Now, so the, 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 this result is when you can contain it, an outbreak. Suppose you fail to contain an outbreak, then the disease will spread, and we prove that there is a theoretical endemic state which we can also give you a lot of information on. In particular, the fraction of, uh, of individuals that are uh, infected in this endemic state is proportional to the required response to curb the disease at, right at, to nip it in the bud minus the actual response. If the actual response exceeds the minimum required response, so of course there's no endemic state. But if it doesn't, then not only is the disease going to uh, spread into a full-blown full epidemic, but the endemic state still depends on this, uh, the, 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 the effectiveness of the response. Now, I, but I don't want to dwell on this, uh, the, this result because this, is, this result is based on the initial response. In reality, the, res 
the society's response capabilities improve as one, uh, you know, reorganize resources and priorities, response and capability generally improves with time. And it takes a long time before it reaches the endemic state. So what this really is, is a time-dependent dynamical system where the coefficients in the equations change with time. Okay, okay so the very quickly, the last topic, I want to talk about the dynamics of the brain. Okay, so uh, in the last uh, seven or eight, uh, um, years I've taken a more than casual interest in neuroscience and um, so wh why, why should a mathematician, why should a someone in dynamical systems be interested in the brain? I've been asked that many many times and I like to answer that question. First, the brain is a dynamical system. Okay? It's a vast and complex network, it's a structured hi hierarchical network consisting of about 10 to the 11 nodes, namely neurons, that are themselves smaller dynamical systems in their own right. Now, not to downplay the many uh, biophysical and biochemical processes that go on in the brain, but the dynamical interaction between neurons and, between, uh, and among brain regions is an integral part of how the brain works. So it is, uh, uh, the, the, there is every reason for, for, for people in dynamical systems to be interested in the brain. And the second reason is that just as uh, celestial mechanics and statistical physics did 100 years ago, Biological sciences, I think, will likely provide impetus for many new ideas and new developments in dynamical systems. So these are the two reasons that, make, that got me interested in uh, the brain. Now, what can a mathematician do about the brain? I've also been asked that many times, so I'd like to share my one person's experience. So my work comes in two parts. There's a neuroscience part, where I'm I work primarily with the visual system of primates, and I've done mostly computational modeling of the primate visual cortex. In this part of my work, I put on the hat of a neuroscientist. I get my hands dirty. I work directly with the neuroanatomy and experimental data. Okay? But then there is the other part, where I use my knowledge from the first part, and I extract the ideas and phenomena and try to turn them into mathematics. Okay. It's not that easy because very often we don't even have the language to talk about it. But so the aim of the first part is to make biology more quantitative, to bring biology a little bit closer to us, so to speak. And the aim of the second part is to enrich mathematics and to open up new directions for dynamical systems. Okay. So I'd like to give you a one minute uh, crash course on the part of the brain that I work with, if I may. Okay, so, the, um, so the, what you see up there is the lateral view of a uh, uh, primate um, brain. The, on the left is the eye, and when information, uh, when light hits the retina, the, uh, the, the, the cells in your retina, it gets passed immediately to two little uh, peanut-sized objects on the two sides of your brain called LGN, lateral geniculus nuclei. And from there, it goes directly to the visual cortex, which is located at the back of your head. Okay. So the retina and LGN are tiled with cells that, of course, I'm way oversimplifying, but it's more or less the picture. It's tiled with basically two kinds of cells. One kind gets excited when its visual field goes from light to dark, and the other one gets excited when it goes from dark to light. So these very two very simple pieces of information get passed to the visual cortex at the back of your head, and where there are hundreds of thousands of neurons, and they start their dynamical interaction. And first what it does is, what they do is that they form a map of the visual field in front of you in, in terms of edges. It's like an, a direction field. And then from that, it slowly passes further downstream and extracts uh, geometric shapes, motion, etc. The important fact is that the brain does not store visual images pixel by pixel. It transforms, suppresses, enhances, it, it modifies the information that comes into your visual field a lot more than you know uh, to enable us to make sense of the visual world around us. Okay. So what do I do? Uh, my aim is to figure out how the brain does all that, a coherent understanding of the visual processing. And given my training in mathematics, naturally I'm drawn to dynamical mechanisms. Now, the method is computational modeling. And what this consists of is, is essentially solving an inverse problem. Okay? I told you that the brain is a dynamical system, but we only have partial knowledge of this dynamical system. We don't know everything about it. 
So to find out more about it, you do experiments. You, so in mathematical language, you, uh, you, you stimulate or you force, you, you, you put on a forcing of the, uh, 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 to the system, you stimulate the system, and you look at how it responds. And you try different forcing, and you look at how it responds. And you, from that information, you work backwards and to try to reconstruct the dynamical system to figure out what's going on. Okay. So here's just a picture that I can't resist showing you, uh, an activity map of the model produced, uh, or, or, or of uh, some simulations produced by the model that I've been working with. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's kind of like an fMRI, except that it's on a neuronal level, and so every pixel that you see is the interaction of 30, uh, 30 or so neurons. Okay? Now, I want to go back to mathematics. Okay? Here are the future directions I'd like to bring back to dynamical systems. First, there are the usual applied math type problems, dimension reduction, inverse problems, computation, etc. But I'd like to mention a few problems that are, that are specific to neuroscience. The first is I think that there's a large networks of smaller interacting dynamical systems is an area that could use a lot more development. Okay. We now can know a fair amount about small dynamical systems, but putting them all together in a network, we don't know so much about, and I think we will see a lot more work in this direction in the future. Now, for large dynamical systems, chaotic behavior is not exactly the thing to look for. In fact, it's not so clear what chaotic behavior means, but rather the, 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 the word is emergent phenomena. Emergent phenomena are phenomena that emerge from interactions among different components in a large network. By looking at individual components, you cannot see these phenomena. So in the case of neuroscience, by examining individual neurons, or even small numbers of individual neurons, one cannot see what is going on, but put them together, let them interact, and a whole new world starts to happen. Okay? So I think we in dynamical systems could do a lot more work in emergent phenomena. And the third uh, item has to do with comp competitions of subpopulations with opposing actions. Okay. Now, the, the people have, of course, studied uh, uh, predator-prey type of problems, but I think we can do a lot more of that. And the reason is that in biology, competition and balancing is really characteristic of much of biology. Okay. It's always opposing forces, one trying to cause you to go this way, one trying to cause you to go that way, and the key word is balancing, balancing, and balancing. This is what you constantly see in biology. In neuroscience in particular, it's especially, the situation is especially transparent. There are two large classes of, uh, of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory. Of course, there are many subclasses, but excitatory and inhibitory, excitatory neurons try to excite the local circuitry, and inhibitory neurons try to in, make the activity go away. And those two classes are constantly in competition all the time with no clear winners. And there's a, somebody has an edge here, somebody has a deficit there, and these types of slight edges and deficits are what shapes much of your brain function. Okay, so uh, this is my last uh, slide. Okay. Um, I've chosen to present to you a cross-section of my work in dynamical systems, from smooth ergodic theory to statistical properties in geometry, strange attractors and shear-induced chaos, to infectious diseases and neuroscience. Okay. I've chosen this cross-section uh, to offer a glimpse of the very rich and very diverse culture of my field and its potentials. In the last 100 years, dynamical systems has matured and blossomed. We have developed many ideas and techniques that we are proud to call our own. But just as the subject is about moving objects and evolving processes, dynamical systems as a field has also evolved. As with any human endeavor, it must continue to evolve if it is to remain vibrant and relevant as a field of research. I see a future full of possibilities, and I invite you to join me at a new frontier. Thank you for your attention. Well, it's unfortunate that we don't have the chance to make questions, but I invite especially the young mathematician and the students to take advantage of the conference and her presence to really, to really go into this endeavor. Thank you so much, and let's thank Lysan Yan again. Mm -hmm.